Made possible by generous gifts from George and Anita Speak of California. Uh, Mr. Speak was a retired Raytheon engineer who approached me a couple years ago with the premise that too much of the public discourse is on faulty facts, incomplete facts, or emotion. So he proposed a data-driven debate, and here we are. So we're going to have two topics now tonight, the first topic being super companies. That's defined as a company whose net worth is more than a trillion dollars. Uh, here's the question that's going to be uh, debated tonight. The rise of super companies like Apple and Amazon are good for the American economy in the long term. Uh, Ab Abby Chen will be arguing the affirmative. Abby, if you could raise your hand. There we go. So it's her burden of proof. Uh, arguing the negative will be Danny Dew. And the second uh, topic will be artificial intelligence. The question is this. Artificial intelligence will have more positive than negative effects in the labor market. Arguing the affirmative position is Mary Preston Austin. And arguing against that is Courtney Bear. So uh, our judges are Dr. Tim Taylor and Dr. Enoch Hill. I won't read you their long and impressive bios uh, other than to say, I have to read something. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a professor of politics and international relations at Wheaton College, where he enjoys teaching that range uh, from international political economy to East Asian politics. So he was um, awarded his MA and PhD from the University of California, Davis. Uh, my favorite line in his official bio is, if he had spare time, he would enjoy fishing, hiking, and exploring the outdoors. <laughs> Dr. Enoch Hill uh, was a triple major at Wheaton College. Uh, I have, think you're the only triple major I've met at any institution. and. Uh, Dr. Hill received his PhD uh, from the University of Minnesota. And in his official bio, it says, someone once told me choices between good and bad are generally easy, easy to make. The difficult choices involve distinguishing between better and best, which is a really profound statement. Uh, economics is a study of making this distinction. So uh, we are here uh, to... Uh, to hear some couple of great topics uh, argued. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Captain David Iglesias. I run the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. Here's the format. So 15 minutes, case in chief, that's the affirmative side. And then five minutes, question from the judges. And then five minutes, one question only from, the, uh, from an opponent with an answer that does not exceed five minutes. So in the first case, uh, Abby and Danny get to ask one question. The answer cannot exceed five minutes. I am uh, remiss in not introducing uh, Joel Erickson, who is last year's grand prize winner and is our timekeeper and coach. So uh, Joel, thank you for coming back. So case in chief, questions from the judges, one minute uh, or one question uh, from the opponents. And then there's 15 minutes of rebuttal. That's the negative side. Five minutes of questions from the judges. Uh, and then five minutes, one question from the opponent, like before. And then it'll end with five minutes of sur rebuttal from the presenting party. They have the burden of proof, which is by a preponderance of the evidence, which means basically 51%, or actually 50.1% versus 49.9. Uh, uh, my role is to act as a tiebreaker. In the event there's a tie, I'll be taking notes uh, and... Uh, Let's, uh, let's start with the affirmative position.
In a span of just 21 years, a near bankrupt computer maker evolved into the most valuably public traded company in the United States, pushing the tech industry far away from the big, bulky machines and producing some of the world's most popular consumer products, some of which you have in your pocket today. Apple's products has reshaped swaths of everyday lives. The New York Times aptly titled this article August 2nd, 2018 as, quote, Apple's $1 trillion milestone reflects the rise of powerful mega companies. This is quite a prescient introduction to today's resolution, which I stand to affirm. The rise of super companies like Apple and Amazon are good for the American economy in the long term. Just like spring weather outside, the winds of change have precipitated and poised a powerful, dynamic marketplace with more possibilities than ever before. For whom and how? We'll frame our debate grounds with resolutional analysis to bring the preview of data, there's oceans of it, into our limited scope today. And then we'll move on to five contentions why this is indeed true. Let's look at the term rise of super companies like Apple and Amazon. Apple hit the $1 trillion valuation mark August 2nd, 2018. Amazon hit that mark September 4th, 2018. Since then, they have fluctuated, so they are no longer at that point, just as aspect of markets go up and down. Uh, but really, like I mentioned in that New York Times article, this milestone does bring to question what are mega companies, what are super companies, and how do those impact this? The rise of these giants, we can examine the S&P market ranks of the top 100. Um, unfortunately, only Apple and Amazon have hit that mark, but we're actually going to see beyond that purview into other mega companies or rising companies, just like the resolution titles. The second term that's important is good. Yes, we're going to talk about good and bad, not better and best. Uh, but I, as the affirmative, will be proving a more net positive of the indicators looking towards a futuristic view rather than the negatives. Kind of like what Captain Iglesias talked about, about 50.1%. How that will be evaluated, we'll examine through our contentions. And finally, the American economy in the long term. Now, one good example of evaluating our economy is through the GDP, the gross domestic product. However, that's not the only indicator that we can look at, um, as well as examining sustainable growth and sustained growth for what future companies look like. Like I talked about, the market does fluctuate, but let's examine some aspects to sustainable growth and why that's actually true, that super companies aid and reach that sustainable growth march, market metrics. The side of the affirmative, as in this predictive resolution, I'll be demonstrating to you on the whole why it is beneficial in the long term for our economy. Let's look to the five contingent points that I'll be bringing up today. The first one you can write down is scope of real success. Let's look at the scope of the real success of our companies. For the first time since 2008, the United States achieved the number one spot as the most competitive country in the world. You might be thinking, well, I thought we were pretty competitive since we started. But according to the World Economic Forum in 2018, we regained that spot. It was measured against 140 different countries on 98 different economic indicators. But an interesting quote that was taken from the Global Competitiveness Report by the World Economic Forum is that, quote, among the several factors that contribute to making the U.S. such a competitive country is the United States innovation ecosystem as being one of the best in the world. We'll be talking about why super companies are indeed innovative. That's how or one aspect to how they've reached their uh, points, as well as why this matters. The 13-figure number of a trillion, what does that mean in real value? Well, an analysis of key global markets supports the impressive growth of American companies. The U.S. share of market capitalization was at 45% of the global share in March of 2009, but it has since risen to 61% in 2018, according to the IPO Center at PwC, March 2018. Investors are now more optimistic about the future and the future profit potentials of both Apple, Amazon, as well as the additional companies in the S&P 100 and below. According to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, examining what it means to have a $1 trillion valuation. Now, think about it. Google, which is under Alphabet, but we think of it as Google. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, 
are they just the resources that we think of when you type in google.com? Well, no, not, not only. A Gizmodo writer actually tried to get off these top um, big five companies, and without Google Maps, she couldn't use Lyft or Uber. They use Google Maps. Without Microsoft, she couldn't even go to a coffee shop that used Microsoft for their payment system. Without Amazon, you can't actually use Netflix, HBO Go, Airbnb, Slack, Spotify, Reddit, SoundCloud, Yelp, and many more because they rely on Amazon Web Services. And finally, as of January 2019, 100 million plus US subscribers are on that Amazon Prime bandwagon. And I have to admit, I'm one of those. Uh, but it's really been a lifeline for people who are living in rural areas, for those with disabilities, or for pretty poor college students who don't have cars. Tech firms account for 26% of the S&P's 500, uh, 500's market capitalization, 31% of its investments, and a staggering 47% of the absolute rise in that investment in the first quarter of 2018. And this, according to James Prothokis at the American Enterprise Institute in 2018, is, quote, an undeniable consequence of innovation. Let's look to the second contention as, okay, now we have all these giant numbers of how effective tech companies have been in our US growth, and that second contention is the unique rise of super companies. What's so unique about the companies that we see? While tech titans and other large companies are not immune from valuation fluctuations, five key tech stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Alphabet own Google, together constitute a staggering 19% of total US gross domestic product and stand as powerful players in the American economy. This was according to The Guardian in 2018. The Economist estimates, and we can only go on estimates, that Google, as well as these other companies, provide approximately $280 billion worth of free services, such as search or directions a year. These are not included in that valuation in relation to GDP. Amazon, as reported in September of 2018, captured 49 cents of every e-commerce dollar in the US and employed more than 550,000 people and generated $178 billion in annual revenue as of September 2018. $5 billion and hundreds of thousands of jobs will be anticipated to be coming to Virginia and other superstar cities when Amazon moves its headquarters. The now ubiquitous names with millions of consumers, you and I, um, using these services has propelled development and fundamentally shifted the landscape of not just the book selling that Amazon started off as and retail, but also a number of downstream industries. But really quick, I want to mention Apple as well. Apple is worth over 1% of the world's GDP, according to latest estimates from the World Bank, that pegged the world's output at 80.6% trillion dollars. That means that just one company, Apple, is valued at over 5% of America's $19.3 trillion GDP. But let's talk about the marketplace of which other super companies have been rising. Contention number three is the precedent of market development. The precedent of market development is such that industries downstream from these large companies have also been benefiting. The Economist said in May of 2018 that estimates of tech activity, including those not captured by, fig by figures for investment in the accounts of major firms, make up 20% of absolute business investment across the whole economy and 83% of the rise in the first quarter. Additional investment by non-tech firms has been directly linked to the tech boom using the distribution firms, FedEx and UPS as case examples, where investment has, grow has been growing a double-digit rate in attempts to keep pace with e-commerce. An additional thing to note is that technology is not always measured, or the benefits of technology are not always measured in GDP. The MIT's Initiative on Digital Economies, Timothy A. Powell, noted in 2016 that GDP mainly focuses on the market value of goods and services. 
But digital products like Wikipedia, Google, Facebook, and YouTube, by their nature, are often free. That makes them virtually invisible in terms of consumer purchases, though not in terms of values delivered. What one big contention here really is, is that just because they reached the $1 trillion valuation mark and have since fluctuated does not mean that that is the maximum amount of value that they're contributing to our economy. And much more than that is that other tech companies, e-commerce, et cetera, have been adding to our economy in very tangible ways as well as intangible ways. Patrick Barwies for the London Business School Review said in 2017, that industry patterns are shaping up, operating on a new paradigm, where the threat is that newer, bigger adjacent market emerges, dominated by another player, as mainframes and PCs have been overshadowed by online, mobile, and cloud-based technologies. It's really an overwhelming eclipse, rather than just a horizontal market displacement. Mark Rowe at the European Corporate Government Institute said in 2018, that at the same time super companies risen or on the rise must constantly compete against the next frontier of industry. While market valuations are not unchanged floors, the short-termist perspective does not take into account that the factors that contribute to U.S. super companies' prospects are really of sustainable economic growth. Nobel Prize winner of 2014, Jean Tirole, said that monopolies are not ideal, but they deliver value to the consumers as long as potential competition keeps them on their toes. So what does that mean when we're facing these giant companies? Contention four is that of endogenous innovations of the future. We'll be looking at the endogenous innovations of the future that some companies have already taken grasp of and many are on the rise. According to the Hidden STEM Economy, a working paper of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution 2013, innovation, primarily through the invention, development, and profusion of new technologies, is the fundamental source of economic progress. And inventive activity is strongly associated with economic growth. In addition, the investment in intangible capital has actually demonstrated a lead to our economy. Gustavo Grulen said at the Review of Finance in 2018, investment in intangible capital as proportion of total output has remained flat while the investments in intangible assets has doubled. We really do see that a firm's market value evolves in anticipation of future gains from innovation in a way that a firm's sales values may not be able to. That leads us to our fifth and last contention, representative of the long-term benefit. Representative of the long-term benefit. The apples and Amazons of today may not be the economic powers of tomorrow, but they need not be in order to support our resolution and to support our long-term growth. McKinsey's Global Institute report said in October of 2018, evaluating 6,000 large private and, pub and, pu private and public firms that uh, defined the top 10% as superstar firms. And collectively, these top 10% are capturing 80% of the economic profits of companies with annual revenues greater than $1 billion. These super firms are standing out from other firms because they enjoy returns on investment capital that is generally twice as high as those median companies, nearly 15%. Their size and profitability are remarkable. But projections to the addition to our global GDP and, excuse me, to the United States GDP, as well as to our economy, are significant. According to Accenture's report in 2015, that the Internet of Things could, by 2030, in the U.S. economy, gain at least $6.1 trillion to the global economy, or to the United States economy, $14.2 trillion to the global economy. The next age of the super company, emerging products, new technologies, as they develop into sustainable mature markets, will bring and have already brought long-term economic growth. 21 years from now, the next ticker symbol of a super company, the Apple or Amazon of tomorrow, will come just like the next letter of the alphabet with, quote, big, bold, and smart bets unquote, with a dose of risky, world-changing ideas. According to Scott Galloway in his book, 
the hidden DNA of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google in 2017. I'd like to thank the Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics, all those involved, to our generous donors, Enter Wheaton alumni, as well as the diligent work of my opponent. But as a great book of wisdom once said, the one who states her case first seems right until the other one comes and examines her. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for uh, the uh, affirmative case, and that was really well done. So uh, my first question for you, it has to do with uh, who owns Apple's market cap? Because uh, your implications oftentimes are um, that, they, that the market cap of Apple is directly part of the United States GDP, but with a multinational corporation like Apple who has tax uh, headquarters in places like Ireland, has supply chains all throughout East Asia, as well as Latin America and Europe, is it right to say that the entire market cap can be accounted? So you said like 5% of GDP is roughly, uh, would be accounted for by, with Apple's market cap, but is that a fair claim to make, or is that more of a global GDP uh, uh, contribution? Sure, I think it's really important that we look at the global GDP. We talked about that in the first contention, um, but I would definitely grant for sure that just because we're looking at Apple's and Amazon's $1 trillion valuation doesn't mean that they're directly impacting only the United States GDP. However, in the age of globalization, I don't believe that any super company can rise unless they are on that global scale. Um, but going back to your talking about the number of 5% of the United States GDP. That was a comparison. They're not claiming that it is making up that and is impacting 5% of all our GDP at any given moment, but it's a good comparison to how that plays a role in our economy. Thank you. Another question I have has to do with uh, kind of you, you, you touched on this with monopoly and antitrust to some extent, but uh, using all these examples about the power and that the uh, benefit of these super companies for the United States economy, a lot of those, uh, the evidence you drew, drew from had to do with market concentration, and it had to do with like the percent of each of these companies as a within their given market. Like you know, you said 40, 49 cents of every e-commerce dollar for only one company. Is that good for consumers, and is that good for uh, competition? At the point that we are at, I'd say that Amazon, Google, and I wouldn't be the only one who say that have been really, really beneficial to consumers. It's provided a service that was either not provided for before, has provided a service that's free, or has provided a way for other companies to hop on that wagon and be the downstream companies. Um, your question about is that good for the consumer? Good is an interesting term that could tie in those questions of privacy concerns, for example, for Google and Facebook, or the moral implications of having these companies be on such a global scale. I would say that our resolution today really does limit it to the economic side of things, which does take into account the consumer as well as the consumer's needs. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it's bad that they have taken a large role, have been that company that people have chosen as consumers across the world and in the United States. I'm sure Danny will be talking about this later, but I briefly mentioned the concept of eclipsing a market versus horizontally taking over that market. And we've seen and I briefly talked about how these new markets are different, have developed differently in the global age, but it's actually more so a platform of an economy than it has been just a one product or a service that is being taken over by a monopoly that will control that and manipulate that. Thank you. And another question regarding endogenous innovation. It was one of your points you brought up. Uh, a lot of these super companies oftentimes purchase rising competitors who are entering the market space and have new innovations and they purchase them. Uh, uh, is, this, is this overall good for competition or is this something that we should be concerned about as these companies get larger and larger, they have the, the economic ability to purchase would-be competitors. For example, you brought up, I know it's not one of the companies, but uh, Facebook's purchase of Instagram before Instagram can even get bigger and bigger and bigger. Is that good overall for even competition and for the overall US economy? 
Sure, for your specific example of Facebook acquiring Instagram and later Snapchat, I believe, that actually allowed for the scalability of that model to reach a large number of audiences. So in that example, I believe that it's been a positive effect. But in terms of mergers and acquisitions, we can have a whole other debate on that with a whole bunch of data on a lot of different sides. On that point, it has been true that mergers and acquisitions have increased with the amounts of super companies, as well as the number of, I believe, Unicorn and other um, investments have gone down about 22% in recent years. However, a product of that, or not necessarily a physical product of that, but a consequence of that might be that these companies are innovating in spaces that they need to innovate because the bigger companies have been investing in funding and the resources that they have the competitive advantage in. So I don't believe that it will necessarily be a bad thing or that it monopolizes for new innovations. Thank you very much, Abigail. Brilliant discussion, and uh, I love your data um, to defend your thesis. So you mentioned the word platform economy. It is the economy that few companies that concentrate in the market, like Amazon and eBay, and they centralized their market power. And it is your thesis, and the economies of scale definitely benefited from it. So there is an interesting case. Netflix is America's biggest video stream company. And currently, Netflix rely 100% on Amazon Web Service, a company service that you have mentioned before. According to my research, this platform controlled more than 36% of America's um, internet website. Are you concerned with the biggest video streaming company in America? And its competitor is Amazon Prime, also the second biggest video streaming company. The Netflix infrastructure is 100% on their competitors' infrastructure. So it doesn't mean like in the future they can just take them down if they don't like. So regarding that, are you concerned that the competition will be discouraged in the future had Netflix outgrown Amazon? I would love to ask the Netflix CEO. I believe he should be aware that his whole company is based on Amazon Web Services. Uh, but going more towards the target of your question, is it such that is Amazon going to overtake Netflix? Is that your question? Uh, like, are you concerned that Netflix's entire infrastructure is 100% based on the Amazon Web Service, which is a subsidiary of Amazon.com? Sure. I don't believe that that is a tactic by Amazon to bring in its competitors and then somehow shut them down. Amazon Web Services is actually obtaining mutual benefits from providing the service. They also have quite a few other services, which I even listed a few examples, Airbnb, Slack, Reddit, Spotify, et cetera, that benefit from this. So if the president of Amazon was to just overtake their competitors, like for example, Spotify versus Amazon Music, which my dad uses, but I don't know if other people use, then that precedent doesn't <laughs> seem to lead to a, a very good end for Amazon as a company because individuals or companies will not be using the services in the future. Can I ask a follow-up question? Thank you. Well, good evening. I want to first thank everybody for coming here tonight, for the two judges making this generous time to come to adjudicate this debate, and for Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics to host tonight, and uh, especially Captain David Glacius and Heidi Leffler to make the competition possible, and you know, for those generous donors also who contributed to this phenomenal activity, and for my opponent, Abigail, the brilliant analysis again for the family side, I really appreciate that. The question of the resolution tonight is the matter of the long-term good of the American economy. The long-term good of the American economy. 
Well, although the debate mentioned that the super companies is any company that exceeds the market valuation for one trillion dollar, like Abigail mentioned before, there are so many rising superstar like Google or their parent company Alphabet, Microsoft, and Facebook in the discussion of the long-term economy. So for the debate purpose, we need to incorporate them in discussion of the super companies. And we also need to define the nature of the economy as the sustainable growth, the long-term growth in the United States. And I'm pretty sure that Abigail and I would agree upon that innovation and productivity growth are the two key components of the sustainable economic growth. And what drives innovation and sustainable productivity growth? I will contend that first is competition. A robust competitive landscape will foster the entrepreneurship and will drive the economy in the long term, according to the formal Federal Reserve Chair, Adam Greenspan. Second, I will say, is a democratic institution. The democratic institution. Many scholars like Professor Milton Friedman and Professor Douglas Norris from the University of Florida advocated for the democratic institution because they serve as the regulatory arm of the economy and making it more competitive and more productive. Third, I will say, is a secured economic infrastructure. Secured economic infrastructure. This will diversify the risk and make consumer much more confident in the discussion of the long-run economy. The way we survived the 2008 financial crisis is not because that the firms are so ingenious, but the consumers are able to restore the confidence in the current secured economic infrastructure in the process. And I'm going to argue that the super companies are eroding those three components in the long-term discussion. First, super companies symbolize the rise of the modern monopoly, modern monopoly, which stifles the competition and owns the market consolidation. Second, I'm going to argue that super companies reflect the rise of the modern corporatism, the modern corporatism, which compromised the very democratic institution that America relies on. Third, I will say, super companies concentrated their database and concentrated the risk and posed a security threat for the America democratic and economic infrastructure in the long term. So now we begin. First, competition. American respect the entrepreneur is like the British respect nobility. It is a long-term growth engine in the United States. However, the rise of the modern monopoly posed a threat to the entrepreneurships in two ways. One, predatory pricing, and the second is the market consolidation. Traditionally, a monopoly is defined by a market power who can artificially drive up the price and to hurt the consumers, like the Standard Oil, our dear friend Rockefeller's old company back in the Gilded Age. But now, in the 21st century America, modern monopoly uses their market power to create barriers of entry and to hurt producers, hurt producers and hurt the competitors. To support my first sub-point of predatory pricing, let's look at an example of the super company, Amazon. With an annual revenue growth of 40%, Amazon is willing to sustain massive loss and to undercut their competitors. For instance, Kutzi was one of the world promising e-commerce firm in 2008, specializing in the area of the baby product. It is a direct challenger of the Amazon.com. After CEO Jeff Bezos failed to acquire Kutzi in 2008, it immediately cut its diaper product price by 30% and rolled out the Amazon Mom program with additional 30% discount. It was estimated by Professor Linda Kane from Columbia Law School that Amazon has lost over $100 million, $100 million over the first three months on the diaper category alone. However, the investors of Crazy freaked out and they sold their company to Amazon six months later after the acquisition attempt. However, after acquired Quincy, Jeff Bezos immediately canceled all the benefit, including Amazon Mom program, within half years. The result is a status quo, except Quitsy was a part of the Amazon. That leads to my second sub-point, market consolidation. This anti-competitive measure secured Amazon the market dominance, currently 46% of the e-commerce in the United States and more than 53% of the e-commerce growth 
is secured by Amazon. Similarly, with more than 460 billion cash reserves, other super companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft uphold the principle that if you can't build it, if you can't compete with it, purchase it. By 2016, Google has acquired 200 technology startups, mostly with a principle like the Amazon acquiring Quizzy, according to Professor Kang's research that acquiring the startups in technology firm enabled them to consolidate the market. It matters because the rate of the entrepreneurship is proportional to the rate of the market power negatively. And the US Bureau of the Labor and the Statistics showed that the rate of the small business creation has dropped to its lowest level since 1970s. Imagine in 1977, America created more than 35 new businesses, but now America only creates over 18 small businesses in 1,000 American adults. Therefore, modern monopoly reflects the competition sorry, reduce the competition by predatory pricing and pose a threat to the innovation, the first crucial element of the America economic growth. In my second argument, let's look at the, um, let's look at the democratic institution in the United States. Modern corporatism reflected by the rise of the super companies harms the American democratic institutions in two ways, corporate lobbying and the tax policy. Corporate lobbying def is defined by the form of the advocacy intending to influence the legislative agenda. Historically, it has been important to the US government, but now the advent of the super companies breeds a formidable combination of the private economic power and the state power, as they can use their corporate size to leverage the benefit from the legislators. Let's give an example of the uh, HQ search of Amazon.com in the past few months. Amazon kicked off the search of the second headquarters. More than 238 companies in America has joined the bidding process. From this bidding process, Amazon secured three billion tax break at acquire preparatory consumer data. And as an economist from the University of Pennsylvania put, the very idea that a trillion dollar company runs the American idols on more than 230 cities across the United States to extract numerous consumer data on sites and pick up handy $3 billion taxpayers' money is a reflection that the extreme corporate power in our country. The empirical evidence found that the democratic institution is the key indicator of America's democratic success and the economic success. 20% of America's GDP per capita is, in their estimate, reflected upon the democratic institution over the past 100 years compared to the non-democratic countries. But Amazon's rise reflects the compromise of the constituent's power over the politician. And it is a sad sliding of democratic erosion. Second, let's look like the effectiveness of the tax break that Amazon has brought. Well, it's just happening. So let's look at the uh, example of Apple, which is another super company. According to the example and analysis by Moody Corporation, Apple has managed to gain more than $90 billion of the tax benefit or tax inversions in the last 30 years. However, Apple has only committed $30 billion to invest in the infrastructure and the job creation. The rest of the money, according to this analysis, was used to by the corporation to benefit the stakeholders in the stock preferential treatment. Empirically, Center of the American Progress has found that the increase of 1% of the corporate lobbying reflected 1.6% deduction of the corporate tax revenue. So it doesn't translate to American people, it translated to the very rich in the American society. In some, super companies have both the resources and the corporate power to overshadow their competitors in the issue of the legislation, and it, it is a formidable threat to the democratic institution, the second most important issue in the American long-term growth. In my third overarching point, let's look at the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. From a macroeconomic perspective, cybersecurity risk is the biggest threat to America's long-term economic growth in the long-term internet-based economy in the United States. Risk in the current model is centralized in a few firms like Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft. And this narrowed concentration of risk provides the vulnerability of the long-term economic growth. A few decades ago, back in 1980s, America was confronting a similar problem as AT&T 
uh, back then, almost on all the telecom communication networks in the United States. It was a serious security concern for the American regulators. Therefore, they broke them apart. They broke AT&T apart into the smaller bills in order to hedge the risk of the potential security breach. Today, in the 21st century, we are confronting with a similar issue, just much more daunting and much higher. In total, Amazon Alphabet controls more than 60% of the cloud computing. One of them is the Amazon Web Service, which is the basis of all the internet service company, including Netflix and other dear internet firms that we usually watch at uh, online. And in addition, Google currently controls more than 8.5% of the submarine cables worldwide. Submarine cable is the foundation of the usually internet. So effectively, Google controlled more than 8.5% of the global internet. In the recent analysis by Professor Koshpich in the World Bank Group Chief Security Analysis, it is a serious concern that America has confronting a cybersecurity risk from the foreign competitors and the non-state actors. In his quote, the Pentagon has been operating under the assumption that the system has already been compromised, and the current centralized model in which the super companies dominated post a cybersecurity threat to the future. According to his analysis and the University of Cambridge Center of Risk Studies, a hypothetical financial meltdown from the cybersecurity threat will cost the United States $1 trillion. And it is a probabilistic event in the next 20 years, given the current centralized model in his research. And the alternative model put forward by the George Mason University indicated that in order to hedge the risk of the cybersecurity threat, we need to decentralize our database from those super companies, but in a more decentralized format, like blockchain technology and a smaller firms, like what America did to the AT&T. In conclusion, the central theme of the debate is not only about the gains of the American economy in the short term, but about the sustainability, the long-term growth of American economy in the long term. Thus, three elements are very important. Competition, democratic institution, and a secured economic framework. They are the crucial component of the long-term growth of the US economy in the past 100 years. Well, unfortunately, today we live in the new Gilded Age. Established titans like Amazon and Alphabet use their deep pocket to undercut their competitors and to acquire their emerging challengers. Other companies like Apple and Amazon use their immersed corporate size to leverage the legislation agenda in their favor. They compromise the very democratic system in the future that America will be facing and hurt the vulnerables of the US economy since those tax breaks usually did not trickle down, expanding the inequality. Most importantly, the concentrated database of those super companies post a cybersecurity threat to the sustainability of the very economic infrastructure that America has been confronting. And therefore, I believe super companies are inherently undesirable for the US economy. And any market need that would warrant a super companies should be regulated to the highest standard. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm, my first question is a similar question that I asked your opponent uh, is now the flip of it, mm -hmm. which you make the assumption that having corporations be bought out and be acquired is bad. But couldn't that be for many entrepreneurs and innovators, that's their end goal. Their end goal is to innovate. They're driven toward creativity in order to be acquired at a significant markup of existing market cap. Because typically these things are acquired, they're acquired for a substantial premium. So couldn't that actually drive innovation for would-be challengers in order to be acquired? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, according to our economist report that the market concentrated in America would, uh, sorry, overboard has increased significantly from what I believe 33% to 46% from 1977 to the 2017. And I think it is true that the markup benefit and the spillover effect will be a consideration, but the overall industry concentration will be a concern over the competition. And the competition is a drive of the long-term economic growth. Okay, thank you. Could you address also economies of scale? And as these corporations get larger and larger, this might actually be very beneficial for driving down prices based upon their economies of scale. We are seeing uh, unprecedented economies of scale with these corporations. So isn't that good for the consumer and thus the economy? Right. 
Thank you for asking this question. Actually, like a report by the Harvard Business Review has indicated empirically the mergers and acquisitions has discernible effect in the productivity growth, at least in the area of a study, which is the, I believe, 10 technology giant in California at the time, back in 19... 94, I believe. Let me check uh, again. But to your like argument, the economies of scale. Economy scale is a great benefit for the consumers, but it's terrible for the producers. As I argued in the analysis, Amazon really used their practice to discourage competition by acquiring the promising companies like Quizzy, uh, emerging competitors of Amazon, by cutting the predatory pricing. So great for consumers. I'm a believer of Amazon like Prime as well, but the benefit of the product should not hinder us from thinking about the regulation because Standard Oil has great product at the time, beneficial for the consumers, but it is the American public who decide what is too much, what is the price we need to pay for the sustainable growth for the American oil industry. So I think competition is a big concern in the issue of the economies of scale. So I want to focus, I want to stay on the consumers a little bit, because the consumers are part of the U.S. economy, and mm -hmm. one must look at consumer surplus and benefit if we're going to overall weight the U.S. economy. Sure. Unlike Standard Oil and uh, previous monopolies that are based upon spatial uh, uh, constraints, mm -hmm. consumers now could opt into almost any service they want. Consumers, it's cost-free nearly to opt uh, through, instead of a Google search, to do an alternative search. Uh, so... Is this actually a concern for consumers that they can actually opt out of these services? A consumer doesn't have to go to Amazon for their uh, e-commerce. They go somewhere else. They just tend to crowd there, but they're not coerced. Exactly. And the reason we need to concern about this problem is why consumers are not choosing the alternative of Amazon, like eBay, Walmart Online, or other firms, Best Buy. Um, the Americans know better than I do. Um, <laughs> um, the problem is Amazon has this great program called Amazon Prime. They are willing to sustain massive loss. From a report I remembered earlier, they have over a billion loss every year on Amazon Prime for the benefit of consumers. It is the brand habit that make Amazon consumers so willing to go back than Walmart, eBay, or other Best Buy. A rate I remember is 56% of the consumers on Amazon Prime tends to go back to Amazon Prime given the deep pocket that Amazon can offer. The other firms cannot offer because they do not have the revenue stream, and Amazon uses weaknesses to build their market consolidation. Great for consumers, but terrible for the competition. And competition is a drive for the entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is a drive for the American economy in the long term. Well, thank you for that. I w one more question about corporate lobbying. I wonder if your fears are overstated, given that in the exact example you used of Amazon, uh, it was it was Congress uh, individuals themselves, members of Congress, who d chose to rescind the offer mm -hmm. and basically push Amazon out of their uh, potential headquarters in New York. Sure. Sure. Yeah, but that's great. It's very, that, that is admirable for the local politician to stand up against the Amazon. What does that mean? That is like 30 seconds? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So just checking. Um, but I think this encroachment of the corporatism is a serious concern. One stat I show is like the uh, every congressman in America was trailed by 21 lobbyists in the United States. That was a staggering number. And usually it's not a concern because usually the voice hedge against each other. But the super companies have the leverage and the resources to overshadow their competitors. And that is a concern. Uh, of the American public. And the analysis I presented before indicated that the tax break that the politician gave the Amazon does not trickle down to the American public. So that only enriched the mass, but not enriched the American public. Yep. Great presentation. I want to go Thank back you. a little bit to your question about the platform economy as well yeah. as innovation. Throughout your speech, did you address my analysis discussing how this is a new sort of market development? Being a platform economy, being one that has a symbiotic relationship with its so-called competitors, that it actually increases benefits, for example, Instagram and Snapchat growing under these larger umbrellas of effective companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're definitely addressing uh, a type of the platform economy. The other type of the platform economy uh, is Amazon, right? And Amazon usually has a program, uh, I don't know whether you've researched about, it's a fulfillment by Amazon program. 
It is a program that is designed to help small businesses to get their delivery price in a smaller rate because Amazon has, uh, I think in my stat, 70% of the discount in the delivery price. So Amazon has this program brilliantly for the smaller firm, like I open a delivery firm um, that is 20% lower than the actual delivery price. But Amazon uses vertical leverage to leverage the competition of those rising uh, delivery companies. So if they do not act in favor of Amazon, Amazon will actually refuse their service and push them to a higher delivery price. And the program who used Amazon's fulfillment by Amazon program actually enjoy a preferential ranking on the Amazon platform. That is a indication that Amazon is using their vertical integration and vertical leverage to discourage the competition and to discourage innovation. That is my take. But I concur that the platform economy that Facebook and Apple are doing was phenomenal, but I think my example of Amazon outweighed that concern. Yeah. Thank you. Surrounding the debates about Facebook's privacy laws and such, there are a number of consumers who are quoted in news articles as saying, well, I'll just leave Facebook and I'll move to Instagram and use that service instead. In the platform kind of economy of our super companies that we've been addressing as well as whatever future innovations and unicorns that might sprout up from brains in this room or elsewhere actually demonstrate a new sort of market. And while my opponent did bring up great data points and analysis, I'll be briefly addressing those at the last few minutes I have and then concluding and bringing you back towards the data that I did present that was largely uncontested, that wasn't directly responded to in the fact that these super companies have changed their model. It's not the same kind of standard oil or AT&T telecommunications that we've seen before. And even more importantly, the value that they've shown in their one trillion valuations, as well as their revenues, billions of dollars on that global scale, are not the only indicators. We've seen a tremendous amount of benefit and qualitative impact on you and I's lives and American lives today that demonstrate the qualitative and quantitative impact that super companies have had. I'd like to ask you a couple questions directly talking about competition. Have you used YouTube recently? Have you used Twitch? My brothers do. I don't know if uh, college students have time to watch video games. Zappos, Whole Foods online or in person, Instagram, WhatsApp, other companies. These have all been acquired by Google, Amazon, and Facebook, respectively, in separate categories. But that hasn't actually detracted from the work that these companies did originally. What did Instagram want to do? They're still doing that, just under a different umbrella, under one in which the data provided through these large billions of users, two billion on Facebook, I believe, globally, of course, but how that plays into our American economy is really clear. That mergers and acquisitions that we've seen that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing that companies, their scalability, their profitability, a point to which my opponent did not respond, being that these super companies and companies on the rise have a 15% return on investment. That's double that of mid-sized companies. What does that show us? It shows us that we're not actually getting rid of innovation. We're using innovation in a new market-friendly way. In addition to the argument of competition, uh, my opponent brought up some examples of either in the past with, for example, Standard Oil or uh, Carnegie or telecommunications. Your question might be, well, what does that mean in today's numbers? What percentage GDP were they? And how does that play into today? Actually, the super companies of today, specifically tech titans, have less or a different, a lower percentage of GDP impact than these companies did in the past, and yet are providing even more benefit to us. 
we can uh, examine this by The Economist in November of 2018, that the largest five have lower earnings relative the, to the economy than the mightiest monopolists of the past day, with the median profit of 0.16% of GDP. That compares with the median of 0.24% of GDP for four historical Goliaths in the years that antitrust regulators hit them. Standard Oil, U.S. Steel, 1911, IBM, 1969, and AT&T in 1974. Now, your question might be, well, at what point should the U.S. government start to bring antitrust to these companies when they hit the 0.24%? Uh, we can have a whole other debate as to how the U.S. government ought to respond to super companies. However, it does demonstrate to us that we're not even close to the range at which these monopolists were. But in addition, and what's even more important, is that these companies have a different sort of market share and market power. I discussed this in my previous speech, using the examples of PCs and old hardware being overclipsed or overshadowed by the arrival of cloud-based platforms. That market was not a market, I, I would say, 10 years ago or more. And Apple was around 21 years ago. We talked about that in my introduction. But many of these companies weren't around 20 years ago. And what does that mean? They didn't even have a platform. They didn't even have a market in which e-commerce was a thing or music streaming was a thing. These are new market niches that have been brought open, if you will, or eclipsing the former technology, the former goods, the former services that were provided. So we do see that these companies have provided increasing benefits to you as a consumer and to our economy and will continue to in the future. Thank you.